Warning, this may be a bit disturbing for tender or sensitive ears. From Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, published 1st of January, 1744. An extract by Mr. Paul Rowley, Fellow of the Royal Society, of an Italian treatise written by the Reverend Joseph Bianchini, a prebend in the city of Verona, upon the death of the Countess Cornelia Zangari and Bandi of Cecina, Italy. The Countess Cornelia Bandi, in the 62nd year of her age, was all day well as she used to be, but at night was observed when at supper dull and heavy. She retired, was put to bed, where she passed three hours and more in familiar discourse with her maid and in some prayers. At last, falling asleep, the door was shut. In the morning, the maid, taking notice that her mistress did not awake at the usual hour, went into the bedchamber and called her, but not being answered, doubting of some ill accident, opened the window and saw the corpse of her mistress in this deplorable condition. Four feet distance from the bed, there was a heap of ashes, two legs untouched from the foot to the knee with her stockings on. Between them was the lady's head, whose brains, half of the back part of the skull, and the whole chin were burnt to ashes, amongst which were found three fingers blackened. All the rest was ashes, which had this particular quality, that they left in the hand when taken up a greasy and stinking moisture. The air in the room was also observed cumbered with soot floating in it. A small oil lamp on the floor was covered with ashes, but no oil in it. Two candles in candlesticks upon the table stood upright. The cotton was left in both, but the tallow was gone and vanished. Somewhat of the moisture was about the feet of the candlesticks. The bed received no damage. The blankets and sheets were only raised on one side, as when a person rises up from it or goes in. The whole furniture, as well as the bed, was spread over with moist and ash-color soot, which had penetrated into the chest of drawers, even to foul the linens. Nay, the soot was also gone into a neighboring kitchen and hung on the walls, movables, and utensils of it. From the pantry, a piece of bread covered with that soot and grown black was given to several dogs, all of which refused to eat it. In the room above it was moreover taken notice that from the lower part of the windows trickled down a greasy, loathsome, yellowish liquor, and thereabout they smelt a stink without knowing of what and saw the soot fly around. It was remarkable that the floor of the chamber was so thick smeared with a gluish moisture that it could not be taken off, and the stink spread more and more through the other chambers. Remarks It is impossible that, by any accident, the lamp should have caused such a conflagration. There is no room to suppose any supernatural cause. The likeliest cause, then, is a flash of lightning which, according to the most common opinion, being but a sulfurous and nitrous exhalation from the earth, having been kindled in the air, did penetrate either through the chimney or through the chinks of the windows, and did the operation. All the above-mentioned effects prove the assertion, for those remaining foul particles are the grossest parts of the fulmen, meaning lightning or thunderbolt, either burnt to ashes or thickened into a viscous bituminous matter. Hence no wonder the dogs would not eat of the bread because of the bitterness of the soot and the stink of the sulfur that lodged on it. The impalpable ashes of the lady's corpse are also a demonstration, for nothing but a fulmen could produce such an effect. They say there was not any noise, but maybe there was, and they heard it not, being in a sound sleep. Besides, there have been seen lightnings and fulmina without noise, as one may very often observe. And thus was explained away the mysterious death and combustion of a 62-year-old countess, hit by lightning, which no one in close proximity heard while standing in the center of her room, well away from any windows. Obviously, not a case of spontaneous human combustion. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. 
When you are a tabletop role-playing game game master, you spend about 90% of your time trying to come up with interesting things for your players to do. This is 90% of all available time, not just 90% of the time you are preparing for the game. Because as we think we've made clear elsewhere, you are always preparing for the game at all times. It never stops. You'd be forgiven for thinking, especially if you happen to be a mere player in one of these games, that things like the various Dungeons & Dragons monster manuals or the several adventure modules like Curse of Strahd or Against the Giants would provide all the resources and references a GM would need to successfully create exciting and compelling adventures in which to participate with as little effort as possible. You'd be forgiven for thinking that, but not at our table. See, the way RPGs are played, and particularly the way the playing of them has become a form of entertainment in itself without the need to actually participate in the games other than as an observer, can and does lead the uninitiated to believe that preparing for such rousing tales as that time our barbarian went berserk and attacked the dragon, that time our barbarian went berserk and attacked the painting, or even that seminal adventure classic, that time our barbarian went berserk and attacked the completely harmless chicken, just sort of happen organically without much effort besides showing up with the pizzas and sodas. While this can be partially true, in reality it takes a lot of preparation and work behind the scenes to make things like that time our barbarian went berserk and attacked us look as if they happen in such a lazy off-handed manner that it even took the GM by surprise. The natural carefree and flowing manner in which these adventures happen only means that at some point over the course of several days, weeks, or even months, a GM has been hard at work stuffing their head full of useful and interesting things which, when presented with a situation at the table, can be employed to keep a game on track and the players moving forward of their own volition without ever once hearing the distant sound of a train whistle. Because what you do not want to do is railroad your players. Even if you are railroading your players, you don't want to appear to be railroading your players. You want them to think things are happening naturally and that events stem directly from their obviously very important personal decisions. Not as might be the case simply because you as the GM have set them on a predetermined course from which they cannot deviate. Not because this is the only thing that can happen, but because it is the only thing you planned to have happen. Which is, of course, where GMs get extremely tricky and have to call upon their vast store of knowledge and trivia in order to make things seem like realistic outcomes of their otherwise devious machinations when planning whatever adventure the Barbarian is on this week. That time the Barbarian went berserk and attacked the orphanage doesn't just happen by itself, you know. The problem with all this is, of course, the players. Ever sensitive to the slightest hint of a GM actually having fun on their own, the players will immediately be up in arms if the sequence of events doesn't seem to follow a natural pattern as established over the course of the many game sessions they've played in thus far. If up is suddenly down for no readily apparent reason, the GM is going to have some explaining to do. And it had better be a darned good explanation, too. Otherwise, they can expect the players to spend the next several hours of the game session attempting to have their characters pick apart every little detail of everything that has ever happened or will ever happen in the game world. Which is why, every once in a while, it is handy for a GM to know a little something about the world of the unexplainable. Oh sure, there's plenty of magic in your typical adventure gaming world, especially if that world is Dungeons & Dragons inspired. Wizards are forever turning people into toads in between pulling various lagomorpha from a variety of headgear, and your typical sorcerer is just as likely to turn someone inside out as they are to call down the Elder Gods and destroy the world. But these are not the sorts of events and activities we are talking about. See, all these things and the use of magic in general in your D&D world are all easily explainable, because magic exists. So the explanation is, to quote famed 70s Canadian magician Doug Henning, it's magic! Which, while it is an unacceptable and unsatisfactory explanation in this world, is perfectly fine in the sorts of worlds in which the adventure, that time our barbarian went berserk and attacked a puppy, could happen. 
it's a valid explanation because magic exists at your table. Instead, what we mean when we say the world of the unexplainable is the sorts of phenomena that do not avail themselves of a simple explanation, no matter what world you happen to be in and what the rules are. Supernatural phenomena. Take, for example, spontaneous human combustion. The first question is, of course, is there even such a thing as spontaneous human combustion? Well, no. Of course not. What a silly thing to suggest. Although, over the course of, say, the last 300 years, some 200 cases of spontaneous human combustion have been reported, which is odd for a phenomena referred to as a pseudoscience by all reasonable authorities and researchers. Maybe it would help us to understand what we mean when we use the term so that we can see what the problem is. Spontaneous human combustion refers to a death from fire that originates inside a human body without any apparent outside source of ignition. The general consensus seems to be that, like oily rags left in a container in the garage which then, through oxidation, produce a heat of their own which becomes sufficient to ignite the rags and burn them, the human body can perform the same sort of trick thanks to internal processes like digestion, or even just being a bit too fond of the drink. Indeed, in many of the early cases, it is often noted that the victim was a heavy drinker, and the suggestion made that because their daily life involved so much alcohol, the victims were, on the one hand, the source of the fuel for the fire, and on the other, being punished by the divine for their sins. There was little actual incentive to try to figure out what really happened in early reports, simply because the victims were getting no more than they deserved, and because they were often at the very bottom rung of the social ladder. Meaning people who might have been able to shed some light on things were disinterested in doing so. In 1673, a so-called poor woman of the people was consumed by a mysterious fire in Paris. She was reported to be a heavy drinker of strong spirits, so much so that those who were questioned about her death claimed that she hadn't taken any nourishment other than drink for up to three years. When she lay down to sleep in a bed of straw one night, she simply burned up, leaving nothing more than a bit of her skull, a few fingers, and a pile of ash. Little investigation was done beyond reporting the bare facts of the case, and no explanation for the fire was put forward. Not even her name seems to have survived with the story. There were a few other factors that turned out to be fairly common among the many reports. Victims tended to be obese and of low mobility. One 1966 case reports that the remains of Dr. John Irving Bentley, aged 92 and retired, were discovered in his basement, his body having been consumed by a fire that burned through the floor of the bathroom above. Investigators presumed, from the position of the doctor's walker tilted into the hole in the bathroom floor, that he had tried to reach the bathtub to extinguish himself, but was unable to make it in time. Victims were usually alone, or at least unobserved at the time of their death. Few managed to call out for help or otherwise indicate their distress, often with people only a room away being completely unaware of what was going on. In at least one case, a husband and wife were seated around the kitchen table late one evening. She presumably burst into flame and died, while he suffocated to death on the fumes, unaware. But there are other commonalities as well. Many of the victims were known to be smokers of one sort or another. The fires always seemed to be highly selective, often consuming their victims almost entirely, bone and all, leaving much of the rest of their surroundings untouched. As many a crematorium employee can tell you, it takes temperatures near 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit to turn an entire human body to ash. Surely, nothing in the vicinity of a fire hot enough to do that would survive. And why were the fires so tightly concentrated? Often any remains of the victim that were still identifiable, legs and feet being particularly common, would be located just beyond a very tight burn circle that had entirely consumed the rest of them. Well, you can begin to see how strange this all must have seemed, and how attempts to offer up explanations that covered all the facts were simply inadequate. 
Even the case of Countess Cornelia was seemingly inexplicable given the facts, and her death would certainly have occasioned the attention of all available authorities. And yet, the best science could offer was an errant stroke of lightning. A patently ridiculous explanation. So naturally, or rather, supernaturally, the answers had to be found elsewhere. Obviously, there was some unknown new subatomic particle called pyrotron, which did a thing that made people more susceptible to burning because... reasons? Also, too much stress could make you burn up, too. We bet you didn't know that. And also, people can catch fire in oxygen-free environments, again, for reasons. So, you know, it's really a miracle that more people don't just burst into flame walking down the street. Ghosts! We bet it's probably ghosts and poltergeists that made it happen, because, well, you know, ghosts come from people energy or something, so it's probably related. No, how about ball lightning, then? Big ball of lightning comes into the room and burns up everything within it. Anything outside the ball survives, just like those stray limbs. That'll be it, we bet. Maybe. Possibly. But look at the story of the Countess again. First, this is a story related to the Royal Society some 14 years after the initial event. Exact details are bound to be a bit fuzzy around the edges. Second, on the floor of her bedroom was an oil lamp which had been knocked over or dropped and no longer contained any oil, and yet it was completely written off as being a possible cause of the fire. If the Countess, feeling ill as she was, had got up in the night, might she not have taken up and lit the lamp to see her way in the dark? It's not impossible to imagine that she might have stumbled and spilt the lamp oil on herself, the open flame of which ignited the spill and set her alight. Now, granted, there are a few more things that need explaining, but you don't have to resort to a random stroke of lightning no one heard to explain the start of things. And to be fair, the Fellows of the Royal Society, an organization first established by royal decree in 1660 and still going today, and which has counted among its members such figures as Sir Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle, and most every other famous scientist you care to name, did have more to say on the subject. More reasonable heads dismissed the idea of a lightning strike, and even a later suggestion that the whole house had been built over a sulfur mine and that the mine had somehow sparked the fire, a phenomena not known to have ever happened even in the mine itself. No, instead the fellows landed on what may very well be the most reasonable explanation for the phenomena something called the Wick Effect. The Wick Effect hypothesis suggests that a small external flame source, such as a burning cigarette, chars the clothing of the victim at a location, splitting the skin and releasing subcutaneous fat, which is in turn absorbed into the burning clothing, acting as a wick. This combustion can continue for as long as the fuel is available. This hypothesis has been successfully tested with pig tissue and is consistent with evidence recovered from cases of human combustion. The human body typically has enough stored energy in fat and other chemical stores to fully combust the body. Even lean people have several pounds of fat in their tissues. This fat, once heated by the burning clothing, wicks into the clothing much as candle wax is drawn into a lit candle wick. Candle wax originally made from animal fat which provides the fuel needed to keep the wick burning. In effect, many of the victims of supposed spontaneous human combustion were in fact victims of an external source of fire or heat, such as a cigarette or an oil lamp, that in breaching the skin, liquefied fat stored there, turning them into human candles, which continued to burn over several hours for as long as the fat supply lasted. And a lengthy, low-intensity fire could in fact, explain many of the other circumstances. And if a victim was inebriated or otherwise operating at reduced capacity, they might not notice a problem before it was too late to do anything about it. But that's the real world. What about our game worlds? How can the supernatural be brought in in a way that isn't immediately answered simply by saying, it's magic? 
because in a fantasy role-playing world, saying something is caused by magic is no better an explanation than saying something fell down because of gravity. She burned alive because of magic isn't really a first cause explanation. It leaves open whole fields of unanswered questions like what kind of magic, who made the magic, why was the magic used in this way, on this person, at this time and place. It's magic doesn't even begin to get you answers. But having understood the real world reports of spontaneous human combustion, it would certainly present a pretty puzzle for the heroes if they were the first on the scene of such a grisly death. How might it be explained? Especially if the party magic user is nearby with their, no doubt, long list of fire-related spells. And certainly, in attempting to find the real solution to the problem, any number of other mages, wizards, and sorcerers might be caught up in a seemingly great conspiracy only to find at the end of it all that the explanation for the event was a bit of sloppiness with the pipeweed and not, perhaps, a tame dragon. How might the player characters handle it all, and would they be able to find the correct, if unbelievable, answer? Alternately, of course, there's always that one NPC whom the party loves, but the GM has learned to loathe, perhaps because of a difficult accent. Imagine the fun to be had by having that NPC combust right in front of the party for no very good reason. A tragedy, really. So sad. Well, what are you going to do? Thank you for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. We are, as ever, extremely grateful. We're also grateful to our patrons on Patreon, merch purchasers, and people who just generally support the show by sharing, subscribing, and telling their friends about us. Thank you very much indeed. If you'd like to find more ways to help support the show, head over to gmwordoftheweek.com and click the yellow banner at the top. Every little helps. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian, too hot for radio, Casey. Music was provided by the fine folks at Blue Dot Sessions. What if I am, in some way, only a sophisticated fire that has acquired an ability to regulate its rate of combustion and to hoard its fuel in order to see and walk? <laughs>